I'd like to just uh, to say hello and, to, and welcome to all of you um, and to this second keynote lecture as part of British Art and Natural Forces. This multi-part programme of research events focuses on the encounter between artistic and art historical practice in the forces of the natural world and it places such encounters in both contemporary and historical perspectives. It aims not only to respond to the exigencies of the current moment, but to foreground some of the most vital activities and conversations taking place within the field of British art studies. And during the year that is the 50th anniversary of the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. The series includes more than 10 events and recordings of those events are all accumulating on the Paul Mellon Centre website, now including Tuesday's panel titled Observations Meteorology. The final session will take place on Thursday the 3rd of December. So on to today's session and we're delighted to welcome our speaker. Our chair for today is my colleague Shreya Chatterjee. Uh, Shreya is a contributing editor at British Art Studies and she's currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Programme in Berlin and a Swiss National Science Foundation postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Experimental Design and Media in Basel. Thank you Shreya and I'll turn over to you. Yeah, thank you, Anna, for the kind introduction. Um, and I'd, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Anna Kessen, our speaker. But before I get into um, I'll just be reading out some um, housekeeping. Um, so all of you know um, what to do and so on. So you will be automatically muted when you join the webinar, uh, as you can see, and can only communicate verbally if the host unmutes you. So um, the talk will be uh, 45 minutes and we have scheduled plenty of time for discussions and we invite you to ask questions. So to do that, um, it, you have to use the Q&A box um, and write out um, your questions. You can also use the virtual hand raise button if you have a question or a comment to make by audio and um, the host will unmute you. Uh, you can make the chat box to make comments or to let us know if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. The session will be recorded, but no photos should be taken. Any offensive behavior will not be tolerated and attendees can be removed by the, um, from the webinar by the host. So that's, that's housekeeping for now. Uh, and um, so let me introduce Anna uh, Arabindan Kessen, uh, who is an assistant professor of Black Diaspora Art um, with a joint appointment in the departments of African American Studies and Art and Archaeology at Princeton University. Born in Sri Lanka, she completed undergraduate degrees in New Zealand and Australia and was a nurse before becoming an art historian. She completed her PhD in African American Studies and Art History at Yale University. Anna writes and teaches about African American, Caribbean and British art with an emphasis on histories of race, empire and transatlantic visual culture in the long 19th century. Her first book is called Black Bodies, White Gold, Art, Cotton and Commerce in the Atlantic World and will be published by Duke University Press in the spring of 2021, and we're all very much looking forward to it. Um, so Anna's also joining us from, uh, from Perth today, so thanks for <laughs> um, accommodating time differences, and thank you to all of you for joining us on a day that's, it's a very <laughs> kind of momentous day with elections going on and, and new lockdown for Britain. So thank you, and um, I'll let, um, and I'll take the floor. Thank you so much um, to Shreya. Thanks Shreya for this lovely introduction. Um, it's really lovely to see you. Uh, I was, I think when I started at Princeton, I was on Shreya's, on a committee for something that Shreya was working on, dissertation or perspective. So it's lovely to be able to um, be back in, in another context working with you. Thank you too to everyone at the Paul Mellon Centre for, um, uh, for inviting me, Anna, Ella, um, Danny, for inviting me and for making all of the logistics for this very smooth. Um, I'm going to just share my screen so we can get started. Um, before I begin um, my talk, I wanted to first acknowledge that, sorry, can you see my screen? It's looking, okay, just saying that it's sharing is paused. Okay. 
Um, so I want to acknowledge that I'm sitting on the unceded lands of the Noongar people. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this region. I would also like to offer <clears throat> my respect to elders past and present and acknowledge all First Nations people who are with us today. This is and always will be Aboriginal land. And saying that, I also want to echo Shreya's um, comments that this is not an easy day. I understand for many of you in the US and the UK and for me watching <laughs> from Perth. Um, so thank you for taking the time to join us today. And, um, and I look forward to the feedback that uh, you'll give me. This is, this is a, um, a talk that sort of bringing together two new projects and some new ideas um, for me. So I'm really excited to share it with you all. In her recent book, Imperial Intimacies, A Tale of Two Islands, Hazel V. Carby uh, creates a stunning intertwining of archive memory and imagination. As much as this book is about what it means to be British, it also examines how things come into view, from personal and public histories to the idea of empire itself. In a particularly powerful passage, Hazel describes speaking to her father about his life in Jamaica and her realization that she had been, I'm quoting here, seeing through the eyes of the metropole. She explained how growing up in London had given her what she calls an imperial gaze that through the book um, brings her position as a colonial subject into view. This particular passage has remained with me for several weeks. It resonates with something that Jamaica Kincaid also writes about in her book, A Small Place, where she describes how growing up in the former colonies often means seeing by continually evoking a set of references and frameworks to an elsewhere, a colonial center by which to view that which is in front of you. I grew up in Sri Lanka, Australia, and New Zealand. I now live in the United States. All are former British colonies, each with very different histories of colonial rule and with very different post-colonial legacies. One thing that does connect them is the visual and material legacy of this rule, from public sculptures of commemoration to the referentiality of colonial naming. Like Hazel, after years of studying colonial visual culture, I too have been reflecting on the ways my own uh, visual frames of reference are mediated by certain forms of colonial landscaping. Perhaps the most recognizable imperial lens is the genre of the picturesque. As a visual language, the picturesque might be thought of as a kind of um, common colonial lens. It's an immensely adaptable and mobile pictorial form that became, and it became a malleable technique for organizing and translating sight into knowledge across the British Empire. It was not necessarily a uniform genre, as we might see in these different vistas created by George Robertson of uh, his patron, William Beckford's estates in Jamaica, uh, William Berriman's view of Lucky Valley estate buildings in Clarendon, and the ex-convict artist Joseph Lysett's view of Warrena, or Sydney Harbour. However, by constantly reinventing the local surrounds, the picturesque asserted a sense of Britishness through the foreign landscapes it transformed in the mind's eye. Indeed, it is the picturesque that has most profoundly affected the way I see and even imagine space still. Easily adapted and capacious, as Geoffrey Albeck has pointed out, it helped unite the disparate regions of empire. Bringing the, um, bringing the colonial world into view, the picturesque connected empire, sated imperial desire, while aestheticizing the movement of goods, people, and plants that actually sustain this colonial network. The picturesque worked by creating correspondences and allowing for comparison. It's why you might find England and Sri Lanka, or India and Australia. And indeed, I'm, um, I'm speaking to you today from Australind, which is a town just south of Perth in Western Australia, that was envisioned as a place where India and Australia could be connected um, through trade. 
And I'm speaking to you from a state, uh, Western Australia, which was promoted as a place where uh, colonial troops, British colonial troops could find respite from the tropics of India. Under the cover of a global pandemic in which the associations between disease, geography and race take us straight back to the 19th century, my family and I returned to my home in the southwest of Australia, where I'm constantly reminded that while I make these land acknowledgements, I continue to see um, the, the space around me in ways um, that I've been trained to through colonial frames of reference. These histories of empire and visuality then are not easily detangled. In this, uh, this year's, this, sorry, in February 2020's issue of the journal Art History, the, the theme was decolonizing art history, which was edited by professors Dorothy Price and Catherine Grant. In this issue, Tim Barringer wrote that the first stage in, this, in the working through of this entanglement um, has been to, and I'm quoting here, identify empire as a major force in the emergence of art in the modern world. A key point he makes here is that histories of art and empire are coterminous because ultimately what we must understand is that art history, at least the Euro-colonial art and the discipline's heritage is itself a product of empire. The after effects of these colonial networks linger in the Commonwealth, particularly through trade and diplomacy, but they also linger, as I said earlier, in the ways we imagine our relationship to others and envision the places in which we dwell. Which brings me back, I think, to the work of Kincaid and Carby, both of whom in their books demonstrate the implications of these imperial gazes, the material, psychic, and often violent effects of looking. The legacies of colonial visual culture are not only felt in the former colonies, of course, and I think some of the recent um, Black Lives Matter movements and um, Roads Must Fall, um, these, these movements that are having, bringing attention to how this plays out in Britain itself. Um, but perhaps it is that in these colonial spaces where the imperial gaze has become more attenuated and the visual illusion of the empire made more apparent. Indeed, this is why art history has always seemed to me like an important site for provocation, reflexivity, and even perhaps redress. It is a discipline uniquely placed to grapple with the complex and contested terrain of visual representation as a site of knowledge production. But now more than ever, it seems crucial to consider not just what these colonial objects bring into view and how they do so, but what it even means to look with them. This talk then is, is a reflection on these questions by way of two new projects that I want to try and weave together. Both of them are focused on the visual aesthetics that have framed meanings and experiences of correspondence and connection in the British Empire. And broadly in this talk, I want to engage with the relationship of landscape and colonial medicine, which are two frameworks of, of knowledge production that re particularly relied on bringing people and places into view. More specifically, I'll be focusing on the relationship of the picturesque, the plantation and medicine. So I locate the practice and production and, um, of medicine and medical knowledge in close relationship to the expansion of the plantation economy, particularly in the Caribbean, where indeed I think many writers are showing us, or historians are showing us that the plantation was a medical laboratory. Doctors traveled to the colonies to put their medical training into practice and to find um, new information that would influence medical practice in the metropole. Medical networks reinforced imperial connections through the circulation of reports and images, while the conventions of landscape representation also helped to disseminate this medical information. Using the picturesque, I hope to make a connection between the visual logic of the plantation and the observational aesthetics of medicine, ways of seeing that medicalized space and bodies. Alongside this, I want to examine the relationship of plantation surveillance and medical care and drawing on Sylvia Winter's notion of the plantation and the plot, I juxtapose these histories with the work of two contemporary Caribbean artists, Anna Lee Davis and Jocelyn Garner. 
sorry, Jocelyn Gardner. In my conclusion, I return to Australia to briefly consider how these observational aesthetics frame conceptions of the landscape and its people and end with the work of two Indigenous artists who also compel us to grapple with the contingencies and failures of vision itself. Just by way of further context, um, long before I was an art historian, as Tria pointed out, I was a nurse. And it was a job I loved, loathed, and was terrified of in equal parts. But it did give me a way of seeing the world and of noticing the world that ultimately led me to art history. Seeing that is very much in nursing. My days there were filled with various forms of observation. And in several of the wards in which I worked, being unobservant had life-threatening consequences. Of course, art history may not be a matter of life or death in the same way. However, I think movements like the Black Lives Matter and Indigenous Lives Matter across the world remind us that seeing or not seeing, as the case may be, does have real life consequences for the visibility and consequently the value of lives. The picturesque is a paradoxical set of aesthetics. It's at once placeless, as Elizabeth Bowles points out, yet grounded in mobility and comparison. In the Caribbean, the picturesque was the predominant mode for representing the plantation, and it often revolved around an ideal of the wild, untouched natural world, while also showcasing its potential for cultivation. Robertson's depictions of Beckford's estate represent this relationship. In this print, uh, and George Robertson was, I was depicting the estates, as I said earlier, of, um, of William Beckford, uh, who was a plantation owner um, and also, and also uh, a writer who, who compiled a descriptive account of the island. Robinson's depictions of his of Beckford's estate represent this relationship as we see how here the, the plantation is transformed into something like a rural retreat. The landscape of Jamaica is depicted to show its natural bounty, while the rustic laborers, supplicant and pleasing to the eye, reinforce the relationship um, of visual possession and consumption. In this, in this other work by Robertson, which came from the same same suite of, um, of prints. We see the industrial work of sugarcane plantation hinted at through the, the arrangement of the buildings, but the labor itself is alighted by very careful spatial organization so that we're noticing the lush environment, a kind of harmonious um, management of the landscape and the, and the rustic figures. The picturesque in these ways imaginatively, imaginatively improved the landscape and as such it was a useful visual coin, counterpoint to the actual landscaping that, that took place in the creation of the plantation which relied on the clearances and dispossession of the land and its indigenous communities as well as the transplantation and cultivation of people and crops. The picturesque idealized these agricultural interventions as aesthetic improvements to the land itself. Creating a vantage point that in both um, Robertson and William Berryman's uh, drawing of, um, sorry, watercolor of, of Lucky, Lucky Valley Estate, um, allows us to look out over the land. Here the picturesque, we can hard to see how the picturesque begins with a distance point of view from which viewers could observe, order and interpret the elements of the landscape through aesthetic conventions. Amounting to a kind of descriptive analysis um, through this close observation of beauty of the land, observers were able to also overlook the labor and the laborers that sustain these plantation sites. This, um, this interpretive labor also maintained viewers at a distance from, from the people who, from the land, but also from the people who, who labored upon it. This distancing creates um, what we talk about in art history as a kind of transcendent or aestheticizing eye. And it's, it's the distancing 
created through this interpretive labor that sustains this, this vantage point, um, this all seeing sort of surveilling, surveillance, uh, position of surveillance. And I think this view is particularly highlighted in, in Berryman's watercolor, um, where we in the position of overseer are encouraged to quite literally order the, the, the parts of the plantation into a picturesque whole um, from this viewpoint of control and, um, and surveillance. It is this transcendent or aestheticizing eye that the literary um, comparative literary scholar Emily Senior also traces in the rise of late 18th and early 19th century medical topography written by doctors who visited the Caribbean. The association between space and health has a long history in the West and can be traced back to the texts of Hippocrates. Arguably, it was the expansion of European colonialism um, and exploration that brought more awareness to the variations of disease and their geographies. This, this growing awareness led to new forms of cartography and topography in which the globe could be mapped through the diseases endemic to particular regions. These geographies also drew on both a humoral, climactic and um, miasmatic theories and reflected a belief in atmospheric infection caused by dirt or stagnation or, or climate. And this is just an example of, of some of the texts that, um, that you know, were in, were in circulation um, depicting some of these or making some of these connections between space um, and disease. This causal relationship between climate and health was also particularly significant for understandings of the space of the Caribbean um, the, and, and was also connected to the fact that a, the, there was a large number of deaths of African enslaved people and Europeans um, from a range of illnesses when they first arrived in the Caribbean. Senior explains, and I'm quoting here, the notion of the Caribbean climate as tropical was conceptually structured by disease and by an understanding of the tropics as harboring distinct disease agents. So by the turn of the 19th century, medical topography also required highly detailed and comparative accounts of particular landscapes. How a landscape looked could tell one much about its healthfulness. This alignment between visibility and health um, as Senior suggests, characterizes the, the scientific understanding of landscape in this period, end quote. In her reading of the descriptive accounts of, um, of medical officers and poets in the Caribbean, including Colin Chisholm, George Harriet, and William Beckford, she argues that their medicalized constructions of the Caribbean which rely on close descriptions of the islands also drew on the aesthetic vantage point of the picturesque. She reads in their observations um, a positioning that gives them a kind of aesthetic um, or transcendent eye. They write, she says, as if they float over the land, but presenting and presenting an overview of the islands that emphasizes the beauty of the Caribbean. From this position, they're able to maintain an empirical distance, a distance that gives them something like a colonial immunity from the unhealthy environment. And these illnesses and diseases begin to appear as they move closer to the, to the islands, to the land itself. Connecting parts of the environment to specific illnesses, oh, sorry, um, these, these writers made what Senior calls an environmental diagnosis that in making disease visible in the landscape itself allowed them to, to ideologically, discursively contain it in the colonies and suggest improvements to the land. These improvements included um, the clearing and the, the management styles um, that we see on the plantation. So I, I just want to highlight this interchange um, that Senior describes between the literary and visual aesthetics of the picturesque and this medicalized relationship to the land to, to try and 
show more clearly how these two different visual logics were intimately connected. The, this medical vision based on observation and diagnosis was closely tied to the visual logic of the plantation as it was shaped in the, in the genre of the picturesque. Both relied on a particular kind of interpretive labor that maintained the objectivity of the colonial subject and did so to keep them from the conditions that might relocate the colonial subject within the space they described. Um, and I think this, this tension that you, you kind of, um, that is gestured to by this, this emphasis on distance on, and this kind of sense of creating a, a space of immunity um, is also a response to the increasing political uh, tumult over the slavery in the Caribbean in the early 19th century. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the fact that, that the area was no longer this kind of Edenic um, ideal, but actually a site of, um, of great and virulent political debate. The plantation um, was was then intimately connected to these emerging medical geographies and their ob observational aesthetics. But it was also a space where these observational aesthetics could be practiced in other ways. Uh, doctors, as I said earlier, traveled to the Caribbean and found the plantation to be an active site of learning and experimentation where they could observe the effects of these tropical uh, diseases and il illnesses. The horrific numbers of deaths of enslaved Africans who were brought across to the Caribbean also led uh, several plantation owners and medical professionals to publish manuals on slave management. These manuals and the hospitals um, that, that plantation owners built, and there's one included in, 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 Berryman's, in, in Berryman's view, um, and this is a, a plan of a hospital that was built by um, John Tharp, John Tharp in the um, in Good, in Good Hope Estate in Jamaica. I'm sorry, so, um, sorry, I'm just getting my place again. Um, so these manuals and the, the hospitals that plantation owners built cannot be decoupled, I think, from the plantation's main focus, which was profit. In other words, I think the, the observational aesthetics of medicine could, could both sustain, but also reinforce the extractive logic um, of the plantation. And in these, in these ways too, I think the, the point is that um, medicine and, or the development of colonial medicine and the, and, and the plantation complex are, are intimately entwined. I think we see this more when we look at the ways in at the relationships between uh, doctors and, and enslaved people. Um, the commodification of black life permeated all aspects of the plantation, including the hospital, where, as Rana Hogarth has shown, black people became, I'm quoting here, teachable material used for medical experimentation and training. Their bodies provided doctors with um, with new learning opportunities and the care of patients became another aspect of the subjugation that sustained the plantation complex. Not far from, um, from Lucky Valley where, uh, where Bear William Berryman was, was um, based is in St. Thomas in the Vale, we find um, a Scottish surgeon called, practicing called John Thompson who practiced um, in Jamaica from about 1814 until about 18, 1820 um, and carried out various experiments and dissections on the enslaved plantation workers. As well as being interested in proving the biological nature of skin color, Thompson published um, a treatise called A Treatise on the Diseases of Negroes in which he described various illnesses observed, he observed in enslaved communities. Their treatment, including those offered by enslaved practitioners, and the effective or the best, um, the most effective healthcare management um, of these populations. 
Thompson was particularly interested in testing the efficacy of inoculation against smallpox and a painful bacterial disease called yours. In 1819, he published these four small drawings in the Edinburgh Medical and Surgical Journal, a journal that was really important to sort of connecting physicians across the British Empire. And it's still um, in circulation today. In these drawings, he illustrates an experiment with inoculation in when he, which he took the discharge from the ulcers of an enslaved child with yours and inserted it into several punctures he'd made in the healthy body of a, a three-year-old. He used these images to offer an account of the disease's pathology using the skin lesions, the eruptions, as markers of its progress. The inoculation was unsuccessful and the child took nine months to recover from the illness. Now in Thompson's drawings and um, in the article that he writes um, alongside it, the toddler is described and visualized as a specimen. We easily lose sight of the whole for the part. The drawings themselves focus our vision like a microscope and like a microscope attempt to go beyond the surface to reveal the inner unseen workings of the body. We are compelled, however, as attending observers to examine and potentially diagnose ourselves by reading the surface of the skin. Um, because yours was so remarkably similar to syphilis and had and was also very similar to another disease in South Asia called Parangi, doctors were very interested in its pathology and its relationship to climate and, and environment. Thompson's drawings really interest me because they form part of this circulating map panoply of images and reports that travel across empire that connected doctors, colonial officials and colonial subjects from Jamaica to Fiji um, and from the late 18th century into the early 20th century through the practices of observation and assessment. And, and you find in the later descriptions of yours and Parangi from the, le from the late 19th century, you know, drawing on these much earlier um, experiments. While these, this, um, this mass of, of print material would eventually become grouped under the field of tropical medicine, I think it's interesting and, and useful to think too about how these reports provided colonial officials with another kind of transcendent view or vantage point from which to look out across and compare the sites of and the people of empire itself. When we're talking about experimentation on the plantation, we might also think briefly of J. Marion Sims, who an American doctor who experimented on black women, enslaved women on southern plantations in the United States, testing new surgical procedures and implements that would continue to be used in gynecological practice. However, as Deidre Owens has shown, Sims' um, experiments also sustained racialized medical stereotypes that exist today, such as um, you know, the idea that, that black women can stand more pain than white women. Um, and these are stereotypes that you find in medical textbooks still. These kinds of histories um, in which black lives are sites for extraction and remain disposable return to haunt our present. And just, um, just to mention this, this, in this print you're seeing Sims um, uh, experimenting on a white woman, um, conducting a, a, a repair of a vesicovaginal fistula. But these, this, the surgery where he actually began experimenting on, um, on black women. So, but in this, in this set of prints, um, the, the black women who he, who he experimented on are <clears throat> quite literally um, drawn out. Um, and this is a painting um, that was made in the 1950s um, showing three of the women um, who, who Sims experimented upon most. This, I think this woman here is named Betsy. In 2016, the artist Simone Lay created an installation called The Waiting Room 
at the New Museum in New York, um, where viewers could, could walk in and could access a, a range of uh, wellness and, and alternative healthcare practices from yoga to, um, to apothecaries. Um. Now, Lei created this installation to pay tribute to a 49-year-old woman called Esmen Elizabeth Green who died in June 2008 while waiting to see a doctor. After waiting for 24 hours in the, in the waiting room of Kings County Hospital Center in Brooklyn, she fell out of her chair and died on the floor from blood clots that moved from her legs to her lungs. She was ignored for at least 30 minutes as she lay dead in that room. Obedience, Lay says, is one of the main threats to black women's health. One, sorry, to black women's health. And for this piece, The Waiting Room, she drew on forms of knowledge that are passed down between black women from natural therapies to self-defense strategies to expand the concept of, of healthcare and what it looks like itself. And given this history uh, of experimentation and, and um, disposability, I think Lay's work really asks us to consider what the care in healthcare can actually mean, given medicine's intimate connection with these historical forms of violence. Indeed, as a former nurse, I've been continually struck by the work, which returns us to the problem of visibility that underpins medicine itself. These histories I just described of distance and objectivity, of observation and assessment, are also premised on a certain kind of un unlooking of a refusal to see. I think Lay's work can help us to direct um, or help direct us to other strategies of care and other forms of knowledge that also existed on the plantation. A movement that reminds me of Sylvia Winter's distinction between the plantation and the plot. The plantation is a site, but it also suggests an orientation and relationship to the land that relies on accumulation and extraction in which <coughs> excuse me, in which people and plants are exploited as resources. These viewing positions I've described reinscribe this logic. Conversely, these viewing positions remind us or help us to see how the observational aesthetics of, med of, med of medical care can be connected to the logic of the plantation. In, in contrast to the plantation, but not necessarily existing outside of it. Um, Winter brings up this concept of, um, of the plot. The plot was a parcel of land given to enslaved people on which they could grow their own food and feed themselves, thereby often minimizing a planter's cost. So the plot emerges from the extractive logic of the plantation, but it still somehow exists uh, beyond it. It's a space where transplanted slaves could nurture and cultivate cosmologies through subsistence. And the plot suggests forms of relation and a point of view that differs from the relations of the plantation. That anchored, uh, the plot anchors alternative forms of stewardship, stewardship, sustenance and use value. Looking at the plot is to take account, I think, of the assemblage of experiences that may have shaped the lives of the enslaved, but it is also a way to move beyond narratives of the plantation as a site of enclosed trauma. Eve Tuck has suggested that we think through these colonial histories through a framework of desire rather than damage, which is not to deny the trauma of these histories, but it is to move beyond the dualisms of reproduction and resistance, to take into account the complex personhood the assemblage of ideologies and experiences that shape the lives of historical actors. The plot, as I'm thinking of it, is not meant to be some kind of liberatory site or even necessarily a resistant one. It may not even have been a reality for some enslaved communities. However, we might think of it in terms of a shift in perspective, as a space not always visible to the overseeing eye, as a we might think of it from the perspective of the soil as a site of subsistence where plants and knowledge, knowledge could grow, could be used and shared. In practical terms, the plot might have been the ground on which 
Enslaved healers learnt the healing cures of the local flora. Perhaps they grew their own and taught each other. And indeed, as Thompson and others and other doctors struggled to make sense of the illnesses they observed, they very often mention, although they don't necessarily draw on or use um, this knowledge, they all very often mention that enslaved healers had their own methods of treatment, which they passed down amongst each other. This idea of the plot is central to um, this set of lithographs created by Caribbean artist Jocelyn Gardner called Creole Portraits, Bringing Down the Flowers. She engages um, in this series, she engages one aspect of these, of these histories, which centers on a brief revelation that she found um, in Maria Sibylla Merriam's illustrated natural history um, publication, Metamorphosis Insectorum, um, which was set in Suriname, where um, next to this hand-colored engraving of the peacock flower, um, Marion notes that enslaved women that she'd met in Suriname had told her they were using this flowering plant seed to secretly abort uh, their children as an act of resistance against their exploitation um, as, uh, reproduct as reproductive laborers. Um, so in, sorry. Um, Gardner's hand-coloured lithographic portraits you know, draw on these histories by entwining intricately braided Afrocentric hairstyles within the horrific iron slave collars that some of these women would have been um, forced to wear after inducing abortion. And each of the portraits displays one of 13 exotic botanical specimens um, that were identified in the 18th century. She's hand painted each of the lithographs, um, sort of replicating, replicating the process of engraving um, from the 18th century. And she's used um, an interesting or an important naming system, which is the, um, which really parodies the imperial taxonomic system, where he or she combines the Linnaean binomial system of nomenclature with each enslaved woman's um, plantation name. We can see a similar kind of um, plot history animating the work of another Caribbean artist uh, who's based in Barbados, Annalee Davis. Davis um, is interested in examining the post-plantation landscape and often centers her work on the land she lives, which is a dairy farm that used to be a sugarcane plantation. Her interest in the residue of, this, of the plantation takes different forms. And in this work, as if the entanglement of our lives did not matter, she created a suite of eight drawings, um, drawing on family histories as well as official records that traces the intimate relations between men and women of different races and from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, using the idea of contamination, which was often associated with mixed race children, she accompanies these family portraits with, um, with drawings on ledger paper to, to, ground, to really ground them in this um, plantation history. Um, the drawings combine, as you can see here in sugarcane, parasites, wild botanicals, and plant roots. But she, she, she chooses very specific, um, very specific plants um, to also emphasize their healing properties. So the, this is blue vervain, and the, the leaves of the vervain um, can be rubbed directly onto skin to treat fungal infections, um, can be used to heal wounds, can be used for the heart. Um, in the, this, in the second drawing called pawpaw, she's emphasizing the antioxidant properties in the pawpaw leaves. Um, in Wonder of the World, um, she sort of drawing out the, its properties, um, which were very effective in countering um, the effects of these parasites, these worms that you know, that lived in, uh, lived in and around the sugarcane plant. Um, and in this, this work, this is bread and cheese. This was a plant that was often found growing in gullies and was used to weave baskets. So 
this work sort of brings together that entangled, entangled nature of Kalina interaction. In an earlier series called Wild Plant Series, she used 1970s ledger paper, which she found on the farm as the ground on which to draw images of wild plants. Now these plants were, um, were plants that she'd always been taught to, to see as weeds or you know, as, un, as noxious. Um, but she began to, after studying them, began to realize um, their value in, in offering bi biodiversity to the land, but also their historic use um, by enslaved communities as bush teas and baths and medicine. By uh, you know, drawing, drawing them and pressing them onto this ledger paper, for her complicates that singular economic story of the plantation. Um, and it offers, I think for her, it also offers alternative ways of reading the plantation um, while also countering the, the daily kind of logging of, of economic activity, which, um, which we associate with, you know, ledger, with ledger paper. And then finally, in this work, which is called a Bush Tea Plot, um, Davis really confronts the monocrop of sugarcane on the island, while also acknowledging the restorative, resilient, and regenerative properties of, of the land. She, she, as you can see, she, it comprises a glass planter, which shows the soil profile and also allows the viewer to, um, to really appreciate the kind of nurturing environment in which she is, she's growing a selective um, number of medicinal plants with, with healing properties. For her too, this, this work creates the visibility of what she says are near extinct covert Afro-spiritual bush tea customs. Um, drinking bush tea, she says, was a ritual practice by the enslaved. Tea was brewed from locally grown wild plants, harvested in small plots, hedgerows and gullies, and consumed for med medicinal, spiritual, and healing properties. In her words, this work um, allows uncultivated botanical growth to offer counterpoints to plantations as fixed sites of trauma, violence, and exclusivity, allowing a kind of reconciliation with the land and the virtual slaughterhouse that lies below it. Now, both Gardner and Davis effectively move us to and below the ground, returning us to the soil, to the earth, as a site, of reposit a site and repository of meaning directing our attention to these other practices of healing, survival, surviving refu and refusal, they also direct our attention to an entirely different arrangement of the landscape, of unfamiliar botany, of unruly plants, small plots, interspecies connections, of the interdependence between humans and their environment. This is an arrangement and a relationship I think that can take us beyond the generic all seeing eye of the picturesque and its logics of observation and, and diagnosis. Um, in part, I think because these artists work also requires us now to do more than look. Working through the framework of desire that E. Tuck describes, these artists are responding to and envisaging the entanglements and complexities of what agency can even mean. And in doing so, their work raises an important question about our viewing position. How do we look back? And from what vantage points are we compelled to work from to re reconstruct or imagine a past? The observational aesthetics of the picturesque were also important in Australia where the dispossession of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who were literally cleared from the land made room for European pastoralists and settlements or stations on which Aboriginal people were often forced to work as slaves. For the Noongar people whose land I'm on, these clearances involved killings, massacres, and the deportation of their people to res reservations and prisons further north, where they were quite literally quarantined. In Louisa Clifton's depiction of the area near my home, 
She presents a viewpoint that mirrors that of Joseph um, Lysitz, showing a land emptied of its original owners, under control, settled, and carefully managed. These kinds of views of Australia, with their fine prospect, the gentle hills, shady native, particularly eucalyptus trees, and the sea air throughout the 19th century also re reinforced narratives about the, this land's healthfulness as a place for colonists, especially from India, to settle. While Australia's climate and its natural flora were associated with a medical topography very different to that of the diseased tropics, for Aboriginal people, of course, um, colonial invasion also brought with it diseases and practices that decimated communities and the natural environment. Lysette's depiction of this family as if they're about to move out of view takes place, for example, at a time when smallpox was still one of the highest causes of death amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. At a time of violent conflict too between British colony, colonists and Aboriginal communities, these figures who walk away from civilization suggest the belatedness and inferiority of First Nation Australians who could do little to threaten colonial expansion. But here we might notice as well how the picturesque lens, rather than erasing or overlooking these bodies, presents them as a matter for observation. These practices of looking then are also embedded in the formal tools of analysis and assessment that inform art history itself. Histories of visual culture and medicine are not just another way that people and places come into view. They remind us that vision frames what it can even mean to be human and by extension, the social and political arrangements that underpin systems of governance and nationhood. I wonder then how we can look in ways that acknowledge these failures of vision, how, in, how we might bear witness, not stand as eyewitnesses, which is what the picturesque also encourage us to do, encourages us to do, um, but how we might bear witness in ways that Deborah Thomas asks, and I quote, destabilize the ocular centricism that has facilitated imperialism, end quote. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, like many other indigenous communities across the world, were the subjects of a range of observational practices, including as subjects for anatomists and eugenicists. This history is taken up by Wurdjuri artist Brooke Andrew in his installation Vox Beyond Tasmania. The installation was conceived to exhibit Richard Berry, who was the first um, Richard Berry's phrenology inspired diptographic tracings of 52 Tasmanian crania from 1909, which is a, a book made up of 52 tracings of the skulls of Tasmanian Aboriginal people. Um, Barry was the first professor of anatomy at the University of Melbourne, um, and he was a, a eugenicist, um, and his, he has a, la he, a large collection of his skulls, which he used um, in his studies were, were found in the early 2000s and, and now make up um, part of the University of Melbourne, Melbourne's medical collection. So in this multi-level vitrine, Andrew exhibited the book, um, Richard, Richard Berry's book, along with other forms of anthropological material, literature and artifacts. Above these, he attached um, a skeleton, which you can see here. Um, and drilled a hole in the glass next to the skull, where he attached a large, elaborately carved wooden megaphone. Around the installation, you can see uh, 52 portraits of unknown people from Africa, Argentina, sorry, Argentina, Ivory Coast, Syria, Sudan, Japan, and Australia. And these are based on 19th century postcards that the artist has collected over the years. Now, as the megaphone loudly extends into the gallery space like a mouthpiece for the skull, it seems to amplify the installation while also listening in on viewers' conversations. This form of dialogic interaction is a purposeful act of archival intervention that transforms these anthropological systems of knowledge by emphasizing what um, Deborah Thomas and, and Tina Kant also talk about emphasizing effective dimensions beyond that of visuality. 
a monument to the genocide of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, Andrew creates an intimate space for viewers to listen in, to recognise the legacies of these ways of seeing, to recognise their own complicity in these processes, and in this way to bear witness. Importantly, I think this, in this work, he's also asking us for a response. He asks us to listen and opens a way for dialogue that be, moves beyond that narrative of damage, um, to quote from Eve Tuck again, but moves us to a narrative that is also, quote, an accounting for the loss and despair, but also the hopes, the visions, the wisdoms of lived lives and communities, end quote. So let me end then with this work by, um, Plain Scree and Scottish artist Ruth Coutand, sorry, Plain Scree Scottish and Canadian artist Ruth um, Coutand, who puts these colonial histories under the microscope. Her work called Trading Series consists of 11 microscopic views of diseases brought by Europeans to indigenous communities in North America, and one disease, syphilis, taken back to Europe. The diseases, as you can see here in smallpox, are rendered in beads and they dazzle with colour against a black background. Beauty is juxtaposed with devastation. As they reorientate our view of colonial commerce, here diseases traded for beads, they also centralise the labour of women. Beads were a valuable trade item that replaced the laborious practice of sewing with porcupine quills. In their microscopic form, the globular shapes that form into a specimen of smallpox visualize a colonial history of violence. However, the practice of beading also speaks to practices of social and aesthetic relationality that go beyond the transactional relationship evoked in the series title. In the disjunction between beauty and violence, these circular and oval oval structures appear like other worlds in formation. Recalibrating the microscopic viewer from observer to co-witness in this way, Kutan creates space for modes of experience and points of recognition that might exceed the visual logic of these colonial histories. In our current moment, we must continually reconsider the implications of the visual. But art history and particularly British art history might need to take seriously the failure of vision alone as a way of addressing its colonial histories and legacies. It might learn, however, from these contingencies, following the lead of artists who, in destabilizing these visual frameworks, are also creating the grounds for re redressing these histories and imagining new futures. Thank you. <laughs>